decided we were going to start making some guitar parts, which was neat. You know, I, I could make them, and Kathy would do the business side of it. When I came from school, I thought that that meant you were a bad guy, that businesses were bad. There were no rule books, so we'd just make up our own rules of what is it to have a company. Hi, guys. This is uh, Seymour Duncan, and uh, welcome to Seymour Studio. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the early history of the Seymour Duncan Company and Kathy sitting next to me and we started a company back in around 1976 and I'll tell you how we got there and how I met Kathy. I go into this little ice cream shop there I met Kathy yeah. which was so cool she was working or she was hanging out with a friend who worked there and uh, so I said oh I'm gonna I'm playing I think at the Starwood uh, do you want to come down and, and watch a show you know and uh and I don't know, if, did you accept it or not? I don't know if you did or <laughs> always, not. Yeah, free offer to go down and see music always would be exciting. I would have accepted. Yeah. That was Marsha Moss. Mar Marsha Moss. You want to well, tell your side of it a little bit? I think my um, take was one, we sort of hooked up as an item. So you and I started dating yeah. and then hanging around. And, yeah. and, of course, I was the, the girl, which meant that I had the, uh, the house. In that case, just a tiny oh, yeah. little trailer out in what we call Tuna Canyon. So Tuna Canyon was more remote. Of course, we didn't have electricity to it and didn't have even really water, except we got a water line up there. Kathy had been working with uh, Don Felder, uh, taking care of Don's kids. So we were uh, hanging out around there and with them and everything. And then we uh, decided we were going to start making some guitar parts, which was neat. You know, I, I could make them, and then Kathy would do the business side of it because I knew nothing about business. And... Uh, for me, it was a learning experience. And so that was kind of the start of it, and kind of decided uh, to get into business and make brass bridges was, I think, the first thing. The bridges on those days in the tellies were kind of the six pole pieces instead of the three. You didn't have that mass to it. Yeah, but you would show me the difference, and yeah, you could hear the difference. But then that was, that was really a struggle, because while I was committed to supporting you, if you were going into making a widget and selling it, then I came from the school of thought that that meant you were a bad guy that businesses were bad, um, except you and I kind of figured a way that maybe we would yeah. just, there were no rule books, so we'd just make up our own rules. Of what is it to have a company? What is it to make and sell products? And the thing is, I, I think I got a part-time job at J.B. Wilson Music on Ventura Boulevard. Repairing. And uh, yeah. so I was driving, using Kathy's car <laughs> to drive back and forth to work, you know. The up. pink Dodge Dart. It's a Dodge Star, yeah. When the color, when the paint wears off enough, it goes to that like pink undercoating paint color. Yeah, primer. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so I was in the back using JB's equipment. He had drill presses and a lathe and everything, and that's where I was cutting the brass bridges, and then drilling each one out one by one, you know, and the whole bit. But that's and then we um, we found a little plastic box that some some. Yeah, uh, I found the plastic box the because plastic I was box. on the business side, which yeah. meant so when it came time to go, well, uh, what do you have to do with? It? You have to put a label on it. You have to yeah. go and put it in a box. You gotta with have to make some foam. Foam, yeah. My job foam. was to put those little set screws in there. So if you gotta set those brass bridges, I was the one screwing all those set screws all the set in. All set screws, them. yeah. And then the one with the springs in it. Right. right. And then Nebs was where you got those little labels. The labels, yeah, Nebs. I, we've got some boxes around here, and I look at the label, and I go, oh, my God. <laughs> you only chose from four different type styles. And right, said, right, yeah. <laughs> See, we're talking. <laughs> and our little address on or something. Yeah, it was that tacky plastic that you put on the, after you close the box, you put the plastic on and close it around the side, but you never could get all the air bubbles out. <laughs> oh, the air bubbles, yeah. <laughs> Kind of use a guitar pick to, to rub the air bubbles Yeah, yeah, out yeah, yeah. We had to work hard at that. But the, And also, back then, I was working on my own pickup, so I didn't have a coil machine at all. So we went to, I think it was Art Surplus, and we found an old knife grinder where you would turn the handle one time, and the wheel would turn four times. So you make one turn here, and then it would turn four times here. So when you put a bobbin on it, you had to count how many times it went here and then multiply it by four to know how many turns you put on this on the bobbin, you know. So that was it. And then we had to get into a rhythm so it wouldn't like slow down or stop or or if you stop the wheel would go backwards, you know, it would just like do weird stuff. And uh, so it just clamped to the table. table the, the, to the this table, trailer yeah. that I had, which was just gorgeous. I bought it for all of three hundred bucks in uh, Old Canyon. 
and yeah, um, yeah. then hauled it over to Tuna Canyon. Tuna Canyon. So it was really, really pretty. Homemade, crafted, just think of an Airstream, but older school. So it had that little table, and you clamped to the table, so I could sit there and try to do this. Yeah. You're sitting on a little stool, kind of trying to like hold yeah, the wire. Yeah. All, I, I remember it being really hard for me, <laughs> as much as I want to support you. You're sitting there kind of counting, you're directing me too fast, too slow. Don't go backwards. Yeah. <laughs> it was oh, really man. arduous. And luckily, too, this art surplus, it was in uh, Santa Monica. And you could go there. And in the back room, yeah. they had all this bulk surplus magnet wire and everything. Yeah. They had the really cool. form bar and the you know plain enamels. And they had the uh, green polys and the red polys. So we would... And all kind of gauges. All kinds so of gauges. So whatever money we had, we could buy you know like a dollar a roll or something, which was pretty pretty good. You think about it back. It, it may not have been a dollar, but it was pretty yeah. cheap, and you would get maybe remnants yeah. of these old rolls, so you could get enough. But yeah. we would. We had all different kinds of wire. And we were trying to learn, or I was trying to learn. Do I use forty two gauge? Do I use forty three? There's forty four here. So by having all those different gauges, it helped yeah. me later. In years to come up with different model pickups for different frequencies and everything, which was kind of cool. So we did a lot of experimenting in the trailer, uh, putting wire on. I remember we didn't have electricity, and we had to buy like a 350-foot extension cord, you know, <laughs> which was expensive. Not, not so good at all, you know, because you lose so much of the The heck, a lot power. of capacitance on that. And uh, yeah. you plug in your amp, you turn it on, a uh, fuse would blow, you know. But the, er uh, the early days of... Um it was both arduous and fun, but heck, I always figured if we paid ourselves 50 cents an hour, that was better than nothing an hour. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, going and trying to discover where we could get parts, we had to go find four bond. And remember that time we got in the car, yeah. went down to L.A. to go get some more sourcing. I forget if we were going to the uh, AZ or something like that. And Magna Supply Place. Which, yeah. yeah, Magna Supply Place. And we didn't have much money in those days, trust me. So gas was a big deal. So there was our $100. Oh, and we had yeah, and we lost our hundred dollars on that it one blew trip out. somewhere. Point, my looking pocket. for a map or something. A hundred dollars like fell out of somebody's uh, pocket, and we looked everywhere. I mean, we came back, point. and uh, we looked and looked, and we found mm -hmm. it under the tire of a uh, had blown under a tire of a brand new Cadillac sitting there on the street. You know, which was just cracked me up. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And I just said, "Look at this." You know. That or else we would have been hitchhiking back to Topanga right. to, yeah. to, yeah. to get back home. You you make every mistake that you do count because you learn something from it and you learn not to do that again or something, you know. And so it was it was really pretty uh, fun time, you know, learning all this stuff. And I was so excited about it and uh, making the first ones and, uh, and then selling them down to some of the selling, Fred Fred Wolecki. Yeah. Fred Wallachy, we would uh, sell stuff to. Uh, Hank at Ace Music was one of my first guys that ever bought my stuff, you know. And and I always knew Hank because he sold Albert Collins his uh, uh, Telecaster that had the binding on it and everything, the, uh, like the natural finish binding. And Hank sold him that, you know, years and years ago. And Hank may have given him the guitar, you know. And then, uh, but we were, I, I had been working with some of the artists, like from Super Tramp and everything, and always working with Jeff Beck and uh, some of the people that would still come to us knowing that I had moved from England to California. Yeah, to After, you know, we were in Topanga, we... Uh, uh, Kathy That's about had the time, yeah, that we... My um, friends that I was doing the babysitting and yard work, if you will, um, bought a place up in Santa Barbara. And so they invited me to come on up and continue to do that kind of activities and work. And since I was the... Uh, uh, you know, earning part of the earning machine along here to keep us going. We came on up to Santa Barbara, fell yeah. in love with it as soon as we got here. It was really a town that's very special. It's a sense of community. Yeah, nice I remember town. they were having that fundraising for that kid who had leukemia in the early days. And yeah. I don't know if it's half the town went and gave some of their blood to see which would be the uh, match for him. But I remember going, what kind of community pulls together and does that, right. and, and Santa Barbara Santa was Barbara. Yeah, So we landed amazing, here, you know. and um, then we stayed there for a while, and then we needed a warehouse, so then we met the guy with the loofah sponge, Bill. Bill Hillman had a loofah sponge factory. And he was yeah. gonna be one of those, uh, today's, we now call them entrepreneurs. In the old days, that book, In Search of Excellence, wasn't written. Yeah. So let's uh, just call him, he was a sales guy. 
and he was going to jump on the loofah right, right, <laughs> sponge, right. yeah, the compressed sponge ones. Phase. And so he had this building, a 2,000 square foot in the front, and he'd also leased the one in the back. But he really just had a pretty wealthy girlfriend, I think, supported him. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she had the house in Montecito. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we were one of his subtenants in that back building, of which our space, because it's all we could afford, was 12 by 15 feet. Yeah, but the... Um, it's uh, tiny. The Hackett Rackets. Yeah, yeah, they were next door. They were in the they back, took the thousand back, back area. So we we so. that was our literally our warehouse was the first was that twelve wow. by fifteen feet. Yeah. We had that little bench. It was all chain it had a the desk chain linked in. Yeah, that's right. And then we built walls though. Remember we had oh, friends right. built the walls. Yeah. And in those days, there's even a step below the Goodwill store, and it's called the As Is Yard. So it'd be outside, and the fringer came there as it was. And so if you needed a chair, <laughs> you could buy that chair for a dollar. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. Or that desk for $5, yeah. et cetera, or that little parts. Oh, We'd get boy. the reject doors for $5 and put them on just stands so you could build a bench. I mean, because you just don't have money. You just have to be resourceful and creative yeah. and kind of make boy. the dollar stretch. Yeah. Until you went and bought that router and you paid $89 for it. $89. And I got in trouble <laughs> because I could have bought it for $49 on <laughs> sale at Sears, you know. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, so yeah. so that was a funny story because when you're starting out, whether you're starting out like us, whether you're Seymour where you just have it in your blood that he knows or you're chatting with the musician and you learn something, we all have mentors, let's call it. People that are meant to teach you at that right spot at the right time. Yeah. So that that router story is really critical, I think, because while well, Seymour and I were a wobbling over that and I was probably being my you know kind of pouty like oh man that hard-earned money I could know. have saved 30 bucks the guy in front of me we were waiting for our you know three dollars and fifty cents for our Mexican food plate um he turns to me and says you know money's a funny thing you hold on it to it too tight you just strangle it and he he, he told yeah. me about this book at the time uh, Whole Earth Catalog would have been out in those days. We're talking 77, 78. And someone wrote this book called The Seven Laws of Money. And mm. so I didn't have much money, but went and bought that book. And there are some really relationships that you have to yeah. just understand that money is just a vehicle. And if you don't really care about it, seems to be, and do business for the right reasons, it comes to you versus doesn't if you're doing it for the wrong reasons. So, so another one of those. You, you have to learn all. I mean, Kathy was the brains behind all that. And me, I'm, yeah. you know, give me a guitar and I can work on it. You know, that's that's how I was. You know, and then the money that I made from doing that, that's where Kathy had to, to deal, pay the bills. You know, I mean, bills have to be paid. You know, your employees had to be paid. Oh yeah. And and we we never. I I didn't think about that. You know, but Kathy had to, to do she, all that. You know. But you contributed, so sure. I I got to take those. You know, adult ed classes on double entry bookkeeping and then proceed to do it in pencil, which is a big no-no, I guess. I didn't know that. But anyway, but you still taught me all the other really critical stuff, which is about the culture. Who are we? Again, why are we doing this? Why, what's our yeah. value besides making a, making a pickup or making a cup? And you impressed me so much. And I may be the one who sometimes articulates it and puts order to it or something, yeah. but... I remember you would tell me your stories, early stories, when you're just playing, you're 12, you're 11, you're 13, yeah. you're 14, you're trying to figure out about something. You yeah. want to know, you write to the guys at Fender. Right, I used to write to Bill Carson, Bill many Carson. letters. And Seymour yeah. would tell me the story that Bill wrote him back. The first time you got a letter back from the guy at Fender, yeah. and when he explained some of the stuff you were asking about, and I remember just observing Seymour and watching as you shared that story. And somewhere I was right there when you were 14 and feeling oh, what you yeah, were feeling yeah, yeah. to have somebody really answer you. So that become another one that's, okay, lesson learned from Seymour. And one of our rules, we will always answer everybody. Yeah, it was important. You know. We will answer every when letter. When I write Bill Carson, no I would matter. ask him about the early history of Fender, you know, and... 
Yeah. <laughs> when I first did, I think my one of my first NAMM shows, and I think it was like 1978 mm -hmm. at the Disneyland Hotel, I saw this the Fender booth, and I, I walk over to it, and I see this guy's name, and said, Bill Carson. Yeah. I said, oh, my God, Bill Carson. I said, Mr. Carson, I said, you won't ever remember, probably, but... <laughs> he did, uh, actually. He did. I was I was this little kid that used to write to you all the time, and... Uh, and you know, ask you all these questions about the dates of Fender, tell you when they were first made, the first amplifiers, the first jazz master. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, he stood there and just stared at me. He says, oh my God, you're that guy that was asking all this stuff about the history of Fender guitars. Mm -hmm. And you were the first one that ever uh, wanted to know about the history of Fender guitars. And the people didn't really write, they just you know bought the guitar and, and uh, but you, you asked, specific questions and mm. uh, I had to go hunt for him and it, he, you gave me an education which I thought was so neat you know that, that he uh, s said that you know and he almost had a tear in his eyes because he says look at you now he says you're making all these guitar things and guitar pickups yeah. and it's so cool and I said Mr. Carson I said you're the guys that inspired me you know by writing me back it gave me like hope <laughs> that there's people that understand what I'm trying to do or trying to, to learn you know and I was fortunate to get a lot of that history in some of the first history books that came out about Fender and yeah. uh, even some of the Gibson stuff. So it was... It was, it was a really fertile, yeah. fertile yeah. period. So, you know, there's yeah. a lot of... Uh, well, certainly I think we've done more right than wrong things and all the rest of our people in this company that helped build this beautiful company over yeah. now 43 years or something. Yeah, amazing. But there's also serendipity. So we were in that fertile period where you know some of the early people you would do repairs for whether it's dave Schechter or paul reed smith or we were all being exploratory or wayne charbel who distributed our brass bridges yeah man, so it, a lot of history it was a lot everybody was learning and growing uh musicians at that time were very very much in search of how can i have a great neck and let me even whittle it myself to shape it if I can't find one. People were building their own bodies, or and then later people started making yeah. them like Wayne Charbel before full-on guitars. It was just parts. Parts. So and, and Dave Schechter, Dave Schechter built the uh, templates for Wayne Charbel. Oh, yeah. There was a lot of— So a lot of help within the industry. It was like yeah. Charbel, Schechter, myself, you mm -hmm. know, we were all— doing guitar stuff. I was doing the pickups side of it and the brass bridges. I was making the uh, Telly pick guards uh, at the oh, Lucas you, Bun. Yeah, you factory. did that when we got over in Yananali. When we got the thousand square feet, we, we got bigger. Yeah. And you just about, I think, killed yourself, man. You'd be round those Oh, I'd be Finelli breathing all cards. the router fumes from the Finelic, man. And I swear to God, I'd go home at night and I have dreams about like bats flying. <laughs> all around me at night in bed and stuff. And I was, it was the fumes. I, I didn't realize it, you know. Then I started wearing a, a mask, which really helped and everything, but I'd blow my nose and there'd be all all this black soot Stinky. would come out of it and everything. And I smell like phenol like a burnt resistor. So when I come home, <laughs> it's like a burnt resistor, you know. We'd and actually, just, you didn't go home because you had to sleep. The bed was up on top of that. I had to take a shower outside, you know, with a hose and everything. And, yeah, that we did. But uh, you let the hose, water in the hose warm up during the day, you know, leave it in the sun and turn, turn it on so it fills up and then turn it off and then wait till it gets hot and then uh, take a hot shower well, with, yeah. with the yeah, hose. If you, yeah, if you can get a couple of hoses together, um, you know, a 50-footer and another 50-footer, that's a fair amount of water. You, can, you can't a take a long shower, but you can warm that's it up. And water was pretty cheap back then, too, so it wasn't of course, like that. Of course, that was in Topanga. That was way, like, just beautiful country. In the, yeah. in the living in the warehouses, I thought was tougher, particularly in Yonanali because it was so no skylights, no windows. Oh yeah, it was dark Remember? at night, boy. But we at least could go yeah. to Creo Rec Center in oh, Santa Barbara, that's right. yeah, or down the beach house, and so you know, for fifty cents or a dollar, you get dry towel and you get a hot shower. Yeah, and that's okay. how I learned how to take. You know, being camping all the time, you learn how to take a shower in the sink. You know, wash your hair and everything. Very primitive, you know, but you know what? I, 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 I'm still glad I did that, you know, yeah. it's, it's important. And a lot, a lot of musicians are out there too, you know, sure. and and um, it's that's, it's hard being it's hard being on the road, being a musician and, and having ideas that you want to pursue and then having somebody, I was very lucky to have, you know, Kathy trusting what my 
some of my ideas were and what, what we were going to try to do, you know, easy things. I wasn't trying to build Rome in a day, but uh, uh, it's been, you know, many years. It with took us a long time to C- learn. Seymour Duncan, but you, le- you learn, and it's really important for you guys out there, too, to understand that. You can't learn it overnight, but it's, it's fun. It's well, a we, great, great time. We did yeah. uh, another important was we didn't have money for the tooling for humbuckers for a while. Right. So we could only do, even we didn't even have money for uh, strats or tellies, so we would do a rewind. But mu- musicians, we all were living on hardly anything, and so that's yeah. when we started our 21-day guarantee. Yeah. So we right. had to remember that guy, I've forgotten his name, came in, he'd already spent $100 for these pickups, $100 for somebody else's, and then we felt guilty because he still didn't have the tone he wanted. So we said, hey, look, we feel so bad that you've had to spend all that money. We'll wind these to the tone you want. If they don't work after you go, put them, you got to put them in your guitar. You don't know when we just give you the pickups. you got to put them in your guitar. And then you got to go back and you got to play with your band. Are you going to cut, come through in the mix? Is it getting at what you want? How is it integrating as a whole? So see where you could take their words and pretty much nail it. it. Yeah. And But meanwhile, I loved it. You're the first one who said, hey, but if it doesn't work, come back and I'll do it again, no charge. And that's what we did. Yeah. So that was the rewinds, and then we forever kept that with even the regular pickups yeah. as that 21 day. Well, the neat thing, too, is when I started making pickups, um, we ma- I made a fixture, and I used... The little hand router, and I would route out each piece of oh, flat yeah. work, top and bottom, you know, and I had fixtures for each one. And then I had to punch all the holes out. But well, first, I would drill them out. I would drill all the all yeah. the six holes, seven holes in it, like a top. Piece nice and, and straight, piece. though. Very good. And uh, then I made a, a a metal fixture where it was like a drill template, where I would put it in the template, and then I could drill, and all the holes came out perfect. And then I bought a Roper Whitney. Uh, hand punch and that was oh, yeah. to me the greatest because I could set a, uh, on the table I, I bolt it to the table and then I had a, a table on it where I could adjust uh, how far each hole should be and I, I made this backstop for it so I'd slide the flat work to it punch hole I would punch one hole then flip it over and punch the second end hole then slide the fixture over where I would do this the two middle uh, second holes uh, do one, flip it over, and then after a while, man, I mean, we were punching thousands of uh, these things all by hand, and we all would route out the flat work by hand. And then we finally uh, had somebody overseas wanted like 100 sets of uh, yeah. strap pickups. So I I did those, and then we went out and we paid, we, we found Short Run Stamping. Yeah, we did. Which was a fantastic place, and they... Started man, all, all of a sudden we started getting boxes in of the stamped out flat yeah. work top and bottom for yeah. a strat, and I said, "This is very cool." You know, was that? What, did we have yeah. to borrow the money from Joe at the time? I think one, so. One lady lent us a thousand dollars to yeah, begin Joe in Topanga, and then when we got to, uh, uh, we paid her back twenty five dollars a month. This is a little book. She was yeah. a bookkeeper. She'd been a friend of mine in Topanga, and she'd write twenty five dollars paid, and I don't know, if it was two dollars and. 16 cents interest and the rest of it was principal, <laughs> $25 yeah. a month. That little book that we got pages and the pages took us years. Yeah. She's super sweet. But we did it, you know, we which did was it. so That's cool. Right. And then we yeah, got a loan school. from uh, Phil Kabicki's girlfriend. Phil Kabicki's Carla. Um, in, to, in Santa Barbara, Phil Kabicki, at one point when we got to Bond Avenue, he was our neighbor right behind us. So, again, really fertile period. And he was making... Um, both guitars and basses back then. Later on, he would get pretty good renown for his factor basses. Factor basses, yeah. And uh, Jeff Richardson at the time worked for him. But anyway, Carla, uh, she came from some wealth. And so yeah. just as she had helped support Phil so he could scale up, because that's critical. Even $1,000, as good as it is, is great. But you're not bankable. No banks will touch you. So you have to have this incubator money, if you yeah, will. Today, definitely. you'll do it of seed capital or something like that. But you, to scale up, you need either a private person. Carla did that for Phil, and Carla did that for us. And it was, yeah. I think, about 10000 and we got our first from Hughes that yeah. molds, mold, yeah. a humbucker mold humbucker for mold. 
I, it was seven thousand five hundred dollars back then. Which is incredible before you could now. get one bobbin. Yeah, it's enormously expensive. But Hughes was great because Hughes is the one that um, did the original, the ri original humbucker for uh, Gibson, Gibson. The patent applied for uh, bobbins, the T-top mm -hmm. bobbins. That was Hughes Plastic Incorporated. It, you'll yeah, see yeah. HPI on the inside of the uh, humbucker bobbin. And the neat thing about it is uh, we were pretty much your last customer for a guitar company yeah. that they would build uh, a mold for. Then right after we got our mold, they were bought by another company. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and then uh, three months later, the company uh, just, just put them in the ground and they were never used plastic again. And uh, all the employees got let go and everything. But the guy that worked on our mold is the guy mm. that worked with uh, Gibson for, for many years. And Seth Lever was the designer of the humbucker. So And you actually, mm. you were still an authorized service repairman for Gibson. Oh, right. Yeah. So they flew you up to Kalamazoo. Yeah, for five days. Five yeah. days. And so you got to see the factory do that. That's where you kind of later on we had it. You got your eye on that Lee Sona, got yeah. to participate and understand how they were doing their work back there. And um, it's pretty I forget, neat. If, yeah, it's I forget if that was 79 or 70, yeah, 70, 79, 79, something like that. Yeah. See, yeah. we're after Yalanali. Remember, we got our next really cool warehouse was our own. And that was on uh, 716 Bond Avenue, a little short street. We had yeah. the best landlord. Yeah, Bill Jorgensen. Bill Jorgensen. Phil Kabicki yeah. moved in not too long afterwards. Two doors down. Two doors down. Yeah. And we still lived in the warehouse, but it was pretty uptown. We had an office down below, real stairs to go up to a warehouse. And you had a young lady, Bryn, as your she secretary? Came, she came later. I think our very, first, later? our very first employee was... Yeah. Um, office. Uh, no. Um, was Jose? Rick Jansen. Rick Jansen. Rick Jansen. He was a um, high schooler, kind of a bouncy guy. And yeah, a young kid. He plays so, a bass player. That's he, right. He was a young bass player. And, uh, Sylvia. Sylvia Corral. She helped in the office. Yeah, she was an office helper. And then yeah. we got we got more and more. It was Kevin Beller. Well, Kevin was like the first major long. He, he, oh yeah, he Kevin rode his bicycle was, up. He was a great uh, draft man. He he was a bass player also, and I used to work on his bass when I was working at right. Jensen Music uh, part time. And then, uh, but uh, he Ke worked Kevin. He worked really for some precise applied magnetics or something where you had to grind things to. Plus or minus yeah. one thousandths or five thousandths, maybe. So he came in and we, he was bored doing what he was doing. So we offered him a job, and he's still with us. He's our, been our chief engineer for yeah. a and long, And we'll be. Long uh, time. I'm going to have an interview with him a little later too. Oh, so yeah. you guys who, all the amp guys and all the preamp things. Yeah. he's the Kevin's guy. Man. You know, he's he's the man. Yeah. Self taught, but just um, for love. Yeah, what's really fun too is I used to ride my bike. I'm always on an exercise routine. I always die. So <laughs> you I've did not so, ride had, much, but... I've had so many diet. But I used to ride my bike down, and these kids were always playing baseball out there. And um, uh, and they, I'd always go real slow to really mess up their game, and this one girl would always yell at me. On this little short street, it's only a block long, yeah, right? Yeah, it's a, block, it's a small, small block. So the girl, her name was Martha Fragosa, and... Um, so I don't know how Kathy can tell you how we ended up hiring her, but she was been with us for many, many, many years too. She became know? our production supervisor. Yeah, she's started fantastic. there. She grew up on that street. Her mother, Nympha, and later on would become the babysitter of our two kids, yeah, Cody and Cody Derek. And, Derek. Yeah. and then as we had other Liz Etum, she would start to babysit other people we'd like pass along the best babysitter in the world. Yeah. But Martha was just, she just did a great job of overseeing all the days of uh, making pickups, which is really important when you're not just Seymour making the one or two by his hands, but now you've got to translate that into making a whole lot of them. Yeah. Exactly the way Seymour wanted it. Exactly. So that kind of fell on um, yeah. me assisting the team and getting the right people to do that. Yeah. So Who were some of the clients we were having back uh, then, too? Well, then we would have people, I remember, do you remember Tony Dukes coming with Billy Gibbon? Tony Dukes had that long blonde hair. Yeah. I remember he was from Texas. He had those belts that you wear that have your name embroidered on the backside just in case you forget their name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no. you had to wind a couple pickups. I remember to match. one matched up right away. The other one for the other instrument might have been, the wood might have been a little darker or darker. something. 
and you had to kind of go back and do a redo. And again, that's why you have that 21-day guarantee. Yeah. It's for exactly that reason, because there's things you just don't know how the wood's going to react. Yeah, and but then Billy, the, we, we did so many, this, to this day. Eddie Van he's, Halen he's was up. We'd have, we have Eddie, you Gilmore know, and, was um, calling. Uh, Super Tramp band would come by, which was so neat, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. visit with us and stuff. So for me, it was, it was, it was a great time, always learning and, and trying to help somebody. And that's what we were always doing. Yeah. I always wanted to help other people because I had help from the people at Fender. You know, Bill Carson, Ted McCarty, you know, invited me to the Gibson Guitar Company. And uh, uh, so having these friends is yeah. important, you know. So it was. It was really a, it was really a lovely time. So whether it was Albert Lee, and gosh knows Albert can play. And now, yeah. and now Albert's got an ear and can probably pick up anything and make it sound wonderful. But to give him what he wanted, at the same time, Anybody that just wrote us for a rewind like that, yeah. our first rewinding service, which is the only thing we could do. Yeah, um, let's see this. Oh yeah, that was one of the... This is the first sort I'm of I'm almost ad embarrassed to show this. This is like a six page ad in Guitar Player Magazine, because you didn't have to pay much, but it was still a lot of money. Deluxe. I'm reasonably proud of that. It has a, one early, early logo, which is just a type style, but that's all we could get, right? And. Uh, it did the trick, but we, yeah. you, you could so deliver. I, I didn't mind promising because I knew that Seymour could always deliver the tone no matter what you were asking for. So that always was good. Yeah, it's fun stuff, you know, a lot, a lot of great history. It's, it's a fun time. It's a lot of great memories for me and Kathy trying to remember all this stuff. So it's a, uh, but thank you and uh, we'll be back real soon. And thanks, Seymour. Mm -hmm.